Uh, well, Stephen, thank you, and uh, thank you all for coming today and for watching online. Uh, I'm a geologist by training, and so it may be a little odd to be speaking at a health conference, but I hope that by the time that I'm done with the talk today and then the talk tomorrow on the, the dirt book, uh, that you'll sort of see why a geologist would look at the kind of issues that I've been talking about. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the story behind a new book that's coming out in the fall called The Hidden Half of Nature, The Microbial Roots of Life and Health, and it's a book that my wife, Anne Clay, wrote with me. She's a biologist by training who got into the public health field, and I'm a geologist, as has been mentioned several times now. Why would we write a book that sort of focuses on microbes? That's what I want to get at today, because I think that we're actually, you don't have many opportunities to live through a scientific revolution. And I think we're actually doing that today in terms of our view of the role of microbial life and its effects on the nature that we know. Anne and I were trained as naturalists, people who looked at the macroscopic world of nature. We looked at rocks, we looked at plants and animals, the kind of things that you tend to get in geology and biology. But this, the journey that we went through over the last decade or so that led us to actually realize the fundamental importance of microbial life, what we call the hidden half of nature, these guys here uh, on the screen now, to the macroscopic world of nature that we know uh, is actually leading us, I think, to the new way of thinking, a new way of looking at our nature and ourselves that promises to actually bring new perspectives to the worlds of agriculture and medicine two sort of branches of human endeavor that we all care about and depend on. Uh, so what I want to do today is give you sort of the, the journey through our intellectual evolution, if you will, uh, I'm coming to those kind of conclusions. And so in terms of introducing the characters I'll talk today, I'm not going to show you a whole lot of pictures of microbes. They're at, they, after all, are invisible. Um, they're, they're hard to photograph. Uh, but these are some nice color illustrations of archaea and bacteria, fungi, viruses, and protists. These are all unicellular um, microscopic organisms that if you, their ecological relationships, both to one another and to the larger world of nature that we know, turn out to be far more fundamental and important in ways that actually enhance and bolster the health of plants and people than either Anne or I were taught in our education. And that's what I, the, the, if there's one point that I want to try and get across to you today, it's that key point, and we're going to walk you through essentially how we got there. Uh, so if we look at the, the visible and the invisible worlds of nature, the, the, the visible half and the hidden half of nature, and we sort of characterize it on a graph like this where we go in um, sort of cycles of powers of 10, from DNA down there at, at the left-hand side, at the, the root of life, all the way to you know, the meter or two scale for people, you'll notice that the difference in size between, say, a virus and a red blood cell is comparable to the difference in size between a ladybug and a person. And that there's this whole universe of, of invisible life at a size that we don't tend to recognize. And this is just to give you sort of a, a, a hint at the sort of the eight or nine orders of magnitude of scale difference that go between the microbial world and the world of nature that we're familiar with and that we know and can experience in our own lives, that we can like bash a piece off of if we're a geologist or, or study as a biologist. How did we actually come to the recognition of the fundamental uh, importance of the role of microbial life in our own lives? Well, it happened in a fairly unusual way. It happened because we bought an old house with a ratty lawn in North Seattle. Um, this is a picture of our house from the back of the assessor's office back in the 1930s. Um, and as you can see, essentially, there's not much in the way of plants in the yard. Back in the 1930s, it was essentially a lawn that was probably planted about 1918 when the house was built. And when we bought the house uh, in the late 1990s, that lawn was still there. Um, not much had changed. And if you dug into that lawn, essentially you wouldn't find any worms. There was, there was, ver there was very little life actually in that, um, in that lawn. And this was not acceptable to my gardener wife. Um, the, you can give any plant to me, I'm a geologist, and within about a, a, a month, it'll probably be dead. I'll forget to water it. I have a brown thumb. Anne has a green thumb. She's a plant whisperer. She can make almost any plant happy. And this was not her idea of the ideal yard. Um, I liked it in a way because, it, you know, I could throw a tennis ball for our dog Zena to, to, to chase across the yard. It kind of worked. I could get my grad students over to play croquet on it. But for Anne, this was a really big problem. This was not what she wanted in the yard. And she started thinking about, well, what would her dream garden be? How would you actually sort of change this yard and make it something that a gardener would really appreciate? Um, the kind of uh, garden that would actually enhance our experience in our lives and keep her busy and happy on the weekends and after work and so forth. So she started to essentially uh, plan and scheme, uh, you know, 
taking photographs of the house, looking at other people's yards and trying to figure out what kind of things would we bring in and actually try and use to enhance our yard. Well, once we got the plans together and we hired a guy with a bulldozer to come in and essentially scrape that lawn off and get back to bare soil, we discovered that we had a problem on our hands. When we bought the house, there were a few things that we needed to do, like remodel the kitchen, and, but it was in decent shape for a 100-year-old house. What we didn't realize is that we also had fixer-upper dirt. Um, when we took the lawn off, you'll notice that there's not much in the way of organic matter. It's not very brown. It's not black soil. It basically looks sort of tan. What this was is essentially glacial till. Uh, we live in North Seattle. It's an area where the glaciers ran, a large glacier ran over it between about 17 to 15,000 years ago, scraped all the topsoil that had been there off. When it retreated, it was bare soil. Uh, it took thousands of years for the forest to actually rebuild a fertile topsoil that then supported one of the, the richest biomasses per unit area on the planet with some of the, the native forests of the Pacific Northwest. And then when Seattle was developed, we scraped it all off all over again, right back down to bare till and started over just as if the glaciers had just left. Uh, so when we scraped off the lawn, we basically found that we didn't have much life in the soil. It was um, a, a big problem. Well, how was Anne going to actually make a very nice garden out of this absolutely wretched dirt? Well, she took it in her mind to actually uh, restore the soil in our yard by adding organic matter. Her gut told her that, they, and that is a pun relative to where we're going, by the way. Uh, what her gut told her was that um, you know, the, the, the soil needed organic matter. It needed, um, it needed carbon, it needed life, uh, and she took it on herself to essentially undergo a campaign to try and bring organic matter back to the yard. What kind of stuff did she actually use to do that? Well, she used a mix of uh, essentially what we can call brown goods and green goods, uh, carbon-rich sources, leaves, uh, um, wood chips, things that served as mulch on the surface of the, of the soil. She would gather things like oak leaves from, uh, um, from neighbors who were like, quite happy to have her uh, rake them up and cart them away instead of whatever they would do with them. Uh, people who, uh, you know, arborists who would be chipping trees in the neighborhood or trimming things, we would arrange that they could uh, dump them on our driveway. Um, we could then mulch part of the yard. Uh, that was where she got the brown goods, the carbon-rich sources. Uh, in terms of the green goods, the sorts of nitrogen, uh, that was essentially things that were growing in the yard, uh, things that were um, live goods that we essentially, that she then mixed. And she experimented with creating different mulches and compost mixes, um, following sort of a composter's rule of thumb of using about 20 to 30 parts of carbon-rich stuff to one part of nitrogen-rich stuff. Um, she also, though, experimented with having living things. Uh, in terms of that picture in the upper left is essentially uh, coffee grounds that, uh, you know, living in Seattle, there's a, a large supply of coffee shops that are more than happy to let you take their coffee grounds. Uh, it's a very rich source of nitrogen. Um, you know, we won't talk very much about whether it makes any sense to take coffee grown in the tropics and use it to restore your yard in Seattle, because no, it makes no sense. But it was free and it was available. And it worked very well in conjunction with worm compost down there in the lower left-hand corner that came out of, our, uh, out of our kitchen scraps. And the thing that really, I thought when she started doing it, didn't make a lot of sense to me, but in hindsight was really the key thing was she got into applying soil soup to the yard, essentially a microbial brew where um, uh, it was intended to, to, uh, to add beneficial microbes uh, to the plant surfaces, to the soil, uh, as a way to stimulate soil life. And my original uh, thinking of that was like, well, how could adding a bunch of these invisible microbes sort of do much good to restoring the soil? Well, it turns out it did an awful lot of good, um, far more than I ever imagined. Um, I was writing the book I'll be talking about tomorrow, Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. I was writing that during the time when Anne was restoring the soil to our yard. Um, and so I was sitting in the living room writing about how society after society had quite literally plowed themselves out of business or degraded their soil to the point where other things um, then took them out of business. And yet here she was turning that problem around in our yard through the application of organic matter and microbial life uh, to our yard. This shows you our soil about five, six years into the project. Uh, you'll notice the, the leaves and mulch up at the top. And down at the bottom, of, uh, at the base of her pruning shears there, uh, you'll notice that tan stuff. That's back down into that original uh, really crappy soil that we had. Um, but notice that layer on top. She's got a couple inches of fairly rich, or a lot richer than it was, brown topsoil. Um, in other words, she was able to build a couple inches of soil in way less than a decade. And if you look at what I'll talk about tomorrow in terms of the pace of soil formation under natural circumstances, this is screamingly fast. Uh, nature makes it, takes about 500 years to make an inch of topsoil. And did a couple, years, a couple inches in less than a decade. 
What did it do? Well, the, uh, bringing life back to the soil in our yard basically resulted where, you know, in less than a decade, a uh, little more than the five years I was just talking about, uh, the garden started to look like this. Uh, so an explosion of life above ground, flowers, trees, vegetable beds that were put in. Uh, you know, this looks nothing like, this is getting back to what Anne wanted in a garden. Um, and I never imagined that we actually could, that she could turn our, the, the yard that we bought the house with into something that looked like this in less than a decade. And that really spurred my interest and curiosity in terms of what it was that was actually driving the show. And it turns out that you don't really see the action. We, we saw the action above ground in terms of the plants uh, that, were, um, that thrived in the yard. But what was driving the action was a lot of the action underground the denizens of the dirt. Um, things that you can see are things like arthropods, worms, mollusks, yes, snails, uh, not necessarily all good life, uh, but the stuff that's hardly visible to you are things like nematodes and mites, those little sort of red dots that you can see run around in the, the yard at some point. But it turns out the very small, and the very, very small, protozoans, bacteria and fungi, those, those key players in the hidden half of nature, were the things that were really driving the show in terms of restoring life to the soil and the processing of nutrients and elements that actually then got taken up by the plants to support the explosion of life that we experienced and enjoyed above ground. Now, if you look at how much life there is in the soil, I mean, just because we can't see it doesn't mean there isn't a lot there. Um, you know, if you look at about a teaspoon of soil, there's something like 60 million bacteria in it. I'm sorry, 600 million. It's easy when you talk about numbers that large to so sort of leave a zero off every now and then. It's still a big number. 600 million, twice as many people as there are in the United States. There's that many bacteria in a teaspoon of soil. The microbial world is incredibly rich. Um, there's something like you know, a couple hundred meters of fungal biomass in each teaspoon of soil with 5,000 species uh, in a, a, a teaspoon of healthy soil. 10,000 protozoa, 20 to 30 beneficial nematodes. Um, you know, the abundance and diversity of life in the soil is actually mind-boggling. There's this whole universe of life that exists at a scale that we don't perceive that actually has a big influence on the world we do walk around in and perceive and experience every day. Well, so you can see the soil life with which most gardeners are actually pretty familiar. Um, there's the earthworms. When we started um, the project in our yard, uh, I could dig a hole in the yard and we would not find a single worm. Six years later, if I dug in the yard, I'd find sort of thick, rich, brown worms that if you accidentally cut through one, and yes, I'm afraid to say I actually did that on occasion, you would get a whiff of espresso grounds. Um, <laughs> they were, had caffeinated worms plowing the yard. Um, pill bugs, ground beetles, millipedes, slugs, and spiders. I mean, that's the life that we can actually sort of see and experience on a um, regular basis when we went out in the yard. And we sort of saw those things come in in a defined order. The spiders, the arthropods came in, for, well, the worms and the arthropods, the spiders came in first, and then the beetles, um, and then birds came in to actually pull the worms out of the lawn, and then bigger birds came in to take the birds that were actually getting the worms out of the lawn. We saw this progression of life come back to the yard that we hadn't really expected. It culminated in raccoons and then a drunk that slept under the tree in the front yard once the trees are big enough to hide on a Saturday night. Um, but the, the part that we couldn't see of life in our yard, uh, that hidden half, uh, the microbial world, it turns out we think was actually really sort of running the show and driving things. Um, and it was that application of bringing that part of life back to the yard that really transformed the visible part and made the, the garden such a wonderful part of, of my life today that I, didn't really, that I hadn't imagined that it could be when Anne started on the garden restoration project. Um, well, so what is it, how is it that microbial life is really driving, the, driving this uh, ship? Well, soil bacteria and fungi really break down organic matter, and that's the, found, the foundation for building fertile soil that suppo supported the explosion of life above ground. Um, basically, you can think of the tiniest of life forms, um, those, those microbes, as nature's recyclers. They're breaking down the organic matter, those plants and the wood chips, um, um, the coffee grounds uh, that were and added to the soil on the surface as compost, they were breaking it down, integrating that into the soil, and turning it into forms of materials that plants could then take up and reuse. If you just put wood chips out without anything to break them down, a plant is uh, it's all locked up. A plant's not going to be able to access that stuff. You get a bunch of fungi out there starting to break down those wood chips, and it turns out that that's starting to turn into materials plants can use, 
And the more we looked into the life in the soil, the more we realized how there's actually specialized connections and adaptations between microbial life and plants that go well beyond simply breaking down and recycling stuff. So what happens to the microbes themselves? Well, bacteria and fungi are actually very nutrient-rich themselves. In putting their bodies together, they pull nutrients out of the mineral soil, they pull them out of rocks, um, and they're very nitrogen-rich, they're, they're very rich sources of, of many nutrients, and they in turn get eaten. They're the base of the soil food web. And it turns out that tiny worm-like nematodes, and don't tell a nematode researcher that their things are worms, they get really upset about that, so we'll just call them worm-like things, because to me, they look like worms. Um, and that one in the lower left-hand corner there is actually sitting there eating a bacteria. Um, little microarthropods uh, and nematodes graze on soil bacteria and fungi, and those creatures sort of one leg up on the soil food web in turn excrete the remains of their processed meals, and that micro manure is incredibly rich in the kinds of nutrients that plants can then take up. So it's this system of having microbial life that's breaking down organic matter, then get turned into food for other organisms whose excrement essentially is very rich in terms of building the fertility of the soil. And that whole av angle and avenue in terms of a, bi of a biological driver for soil fertility is not something that I learned in college or graduate school in my training as a geologist, and I did take classes in soils. Um, and we m mostly learned that, you know, that senses, the sources of plant nutrition were, you know, carbon from the air, uh, oxygen from the water that gets mixed in photosynthesis to build their bodies. Uh, nitrogen is also taken from the air, but indirectly through microbial helpers, as we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then there's the breakdown of rocks where the mineral nutrients that also are needed to grow healthy plants and to build healthy bodies for animals uh, would come from the breakdown of rocks and conversion into soil and the gradual breakdown and weathering of the soil. But there's this other loop, that sort of green loop over there on the left-hand side of the screen, of what happens to organic matter. Uh, in terms of the organic matter that's produced by uh, vegetation, whether it's the leaves on trees that fall onto the surface of the soil, or whether it's the roots in grassland that decay beneath the soil, that stuff is very rich in the nutrients that are needed to make new life for a very simple reason. It was life. And essentially recycling that is a source of, of fertility in soils that, that is essentially one of the, was for a long time, I think sort of one of the, the great neglected sources of fertility in terms of agricultural applications, but it was one of the reasons why um, fresh native soils were so highly productive in so many parts of the world. They're full of organic matter. And how does this work? Well, soil life recycles organic matter uh, into the building blocks for new life, really through what I like to call the original underground economy. I know Anne doesn't like that term quite as much as I do, so if you're watching on the web, forgive me, I used it. Um, what organic matter does, though, um, is if it goes into the, the, the top of the soil, it, at, at, it serves essentially as an elixir for hungry soil biota that start to break it down and convert uh, that material that was in that organic matter um, into goodies that can actually be taken up by plants, um, and that microbial life that's supported thereby also can help break down, um, break down primary minerals in the rocks. Uh, they can scavenge phosphorus, for example. Fungi are very good at pulling phosphorus out of certain kinds of rocks and bringing that into biological circulation. That kind of phosphorus won't show up in a typical soil test, though, because it's locked up in a rock. You need a microbe to actually liberate it and get it into the cycle of fertility. Um, so that the, the, or the nutrients that are liberated from organic matter and from rock minerals by microbes then are, off, are to our surprise, we found they're involved in exchanges and deals with plants. Um, there's this whole sort of exchange of nutrients that goes on in the world below ground that actually makes the life of the soil essentially and the health of it inseparable from the health and the life of both plants and then the people who eat plants um, or people who eat the things that eat plants. Um, Everything, in other words, the health of the world of the nature, the nature that we know around us is connected very intimately to the health of the, the microbial world, the hidden half of nature in the earth beneath our feet. <laughs>